That sounds like a typical master's thesis. Yeah, yeah. so essentially, I, I just wrote my thesis on all the reasons it failed. Um, really, all the reasons you failed. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't my methodology was whack. My, my data was whack. <laughs> but basically, because it's healthcare, I just get to say, oh, you know, COVID just fucking ruined it, you know? And people are going to be like, oh, yeah, COVID. Yeah, here's an That's A. That's wrong. <laughs> That's such a depressing master's thesis. <laughs> Just uh, sorry, it ruined this too. And the person reading it's like, yeah, I don't know what I fucking expected. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go about how, like, you know, to be honest, my, my survey method was probably really lazy. Um, <laughs> I was expecting them to do a lot of the work for me, which in future you shouldn't do. I mean, surveys are inherently difficult for those reasons, though. Like, getting reporting on any survey is always stupidly hard. I'm not doing you any favors, survey collector guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, I used what was called a snowball method, which is real. It's not something I just found, like, randomly and used to justify my lack of a Which lot is of after the survey is finished, you, you spit it back into the respondent's <laughs> mouth. <laughs> <laughs> the uh it's like one person passes it on to their friends or two friends and then like it just sort of snowballs from there yes. yeah <laughs> anyway so yeah long story short it's it's not so Wait. much the destination as it is the journey you still get your master's degree though from uh, it, right? i mean yeah i i can't believe at this point anyone's not going to get their master's this year there so i will have my yeah, master's desperate. in physician assistant science Sweet. welcome to the brotherhood Putting in a bullshit master's thesis and getting the degree anyway is, is really one of the natural steps. <laughs> I went to the new school for an MFA, <laughs> and uh, the, the way I got, the way I did my master's thesis was first of all, they spend two years just like, we're going to be here to coach you through. You know, you're going to find an advisor that is going to personally shepherd you. And like, like one friend of mine like worked with like Gary Steingart or something. Other people are wor working with like Salman Rushdie. Uh, it, but like it's real. Like this is what you're paying for. You know, to be this close to to power and status and and really have your your creative vision shepherded. I didn't do any of that. Uh, and then uh, like uh, in the last semester, there's like if you don't have an advisor now, you must get an advisor or you're you're out. Like <laughs> you, this is an unacceptable amount of foot dragging. So uh, I happen to be taking a class with like a sweetheart who also studies like Bukowski and and um, Kerouac and Burroughs and fuck there was another one like Naked Lunch who's yeah that? that was William S Burroughs oh okay yeah so he's like that guy but like a real sweetheart every class he's uh he'd wear like a a, a tattered like biker cut. He had wildcat uh, tattoos all over him. <laughs> like he was involved in like a whole bunch of like uh, militant left wing stuff. And, and the classes were always just like, so we'd come in and just like, all right, I hope you read uh, To the Lighthouse. And uh, who wants to start? Rob? And I'd be like, I'll be honest, I didn't read To the Lighthouse. And he's like, you don't have to. Anyone else? <laughs> and I was like, this is my advisor. And, and so I, I went to him in class. I'm like, you want to be my thesis advisor? He's like, yeah, yeah sure. I, I need I need more people anyway. And I'm like, cool, I'll see you when I have my thesis. End of semester, I show up at the thesis reading where you invite all of your parents <laughs> and like there's a big room and everyone gets like 15 minutes to do their Ira Glass voice. And I just handed him a stapled packet that I had written the night before, 12 hours straight, <laughs> about why Jonathan Ames uh, and Boners uh, is funny to me. And he, he took it because he's there like, you know, taking pictures with people. He took it, flipped through it and went, yeah, this looks good. Put it in his bag. Never saw him again. Got my MFA in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> that's solidarity what a comrade yeah well, well so welcome to the brotherhood of uh bullshit master's degrees Dumb and awful. This is Brett. Everyone on this board. This is Rob at Dumb and Awful. This is Brad at Fizz for Shizzle. Uh, before we get into it, I was just looking at something about how Sheldon Aislinn got fucked over by the Raiders in Vegas, which rules. 
uh, and looking at that stadium, they're building that, by the way, having lived in Vegas, they're building that stadium like immediately off strip. It's going to be huge and gaudy and unavoidable. If you go to Vegas, that's like the intent is you just walk up the strip. You, you, you go underneath the highway here and then boom, you're at the stadium. Good luck with that. They thought that was what was going to happen uh, when they built the Pelican Stadium, the Smoothie King Center, <laughs> right off Bourbon Street. They're like, okay, we got Harrah's Casino on one end of the street and the Smoothie King Center on the other. And and Anthony Davis, people are going to be like, what should we do when we're uh, done drinking? Well, we'll I know we'll, we'll keep the party going. We'll go to the Smoothie King Center and see the NBA. Nobody did that. <laughs> I know that because uh, I did that one time. I went to to Harrah's, played poker for like four hours, just destroyed tourists, then took that cash and just walked down the the Pelican Stadium, said, uh, how much will this get me? And they were like, I mean, you could basically play the game if you want. (laughs) (laughs) I was in like row three double fisting jumbo hurricanes and watching the Golden State Warriors and uh, the (laughs) Golden State Warriors and the Pelicans play. I was on the side that the cameras face, so if you watch that game on NBA League Pass, you would just see me taking up three chairs because no one else is around, <laughs> getting progressively hammered and, and yelling at Draymond Green. <laughs> the dream. So it, wor- it worked for me. It did not work for the city of New Orleans. <laughs> so I'm not sure it was worth all that municipal debt they went into. I mean, it's not going to be for Vegas either, but Vegas did this for uh, Elon Musk too. The state of Nevada gave him a ton of money to build the Gigafactory out there. Like, they're all about just, like, selling whatever they can to get more business in there. Like, you know, Vegas, like, cities ever spending for sports stadiums at all is abhorrent. Like, that's a, that's oh, a yeah, hard no for me. But, like, a city like Las Vegas, which is not going to fucking be there in a, in a little over a decade. It's not going to be sustainable. <laughs> it's going to be that scene from Blade Runner 2049. The ghost of Al Davis looking at, like, the Road Warriors, like, I tell you, you can't coach speed. <laughs> 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 yeah, sports sports ownership stuff and all, that whole world is just so fucking depressing. Uh, but even if you're not into sports, it's probably a good thing to know about because uh, to get into politics now, you just have to be well known for anything. In Alabama, Jeff Sessions, uh, the tiny racist Keebler elf. Well, I mean, we don't know that the actual original Keebler elves were racist or not. That's true. So <laughs> it might be redundant. <laughs> That might be where he came from. He might have learned it from his father, who was also a racist Keebler elf. <laughs> There's a reason they started with vanilla cookies. We're going to protect this tree. <laughs> Jeff Sessions has been a, a United States senator from Alabama for ages and was one of the first people to endorse Trump when he was running in the Republican primary. And so he thought it would be wise to join the Trump administration as, I believe he was AG. He was attorney general, um, yeah, which was his dream yeah. job. Because then he could suppress minorities at the national level, just like he always wanted to, and get rid of the evil drugs, just like he'd always wanted to. The evil drugs in this case, uh, not Oxycontin or fentanyl or morphine sulfate, uh, weed. Yeah, just weed. Just weed. weed. Weed's his Jeff main one. Sessions stopped supporting the KKK because he found out they didn't care about marijuana, and that is a true fucking story. <laughs> I forgot about that. Jeff Sessions, Jeffrey Beauregard Sessions, that is his middle last name, was uh, denied entry onto the federal court by Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan anointed, uh, appointed him in the 80s, and the Senate said, no way, you are too fucking racist. You cannot go on the federal court. So he eventually ended up running for state Senate, and Alabama was like, you know what, we like the cut of this guy's jib. And so they voted him in, and he was like a complete backbencher, pointless politician, wasn't involved in anything important until he just decided to endorse Trump. And the worst thing about him getting into the Trump campaign was Jeff Beauregard Sessions' top aide was a little inbred piece of shit from Duke University named Stephen Miller. And Stephen Miller wormed his way into Trump's inner circle and stayed on even while Jeff Sessions was just beaten like a rented mule for months until finally Trump That's got right. him to resign. That is how Stephen Miller got in. Stephen Miller went to Duke? Yeah. Are you surprised? Oh, yeah. <laughs> They they should call their their team should be called the the White Devils. <laughs> mm. That's all I got on the story. I'll see you guys in about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so like and and so Jeffrey Sessions is running. You know he's got he resigned. So he thought that he would run again in the state of Alabama. 
but which is you know made impossible for him because a Trump just shit on him constantly uh, every chance he got. Even though Jeff Sessions constantly said, "Well, I actually agree with Trump when he said that I'm a I'm a tool of the deep state." But you know what? We gotta we gotta be strong for the state of Alabama. And B, he's running against one of the two most notorious coaches of Alabama football in the last uh, 25 years or so, Tommy Tuberville. And this is not even counting coaches like Mike Price, who was fired before he even coached a game because he went to a sorority party and got a lap dance from a co-ed. But in Alabama football hierarchy, right now it's essentially Nick Saban, who is number one. He is a god. He can do no wrong. And then Auburn fans who still remember Tommy Tuberville. Is it Tuberville or Tuberville? I always like the way Tuberville sounds. I don't know. He fucking sucks. Like, either way, like, he's a piece (laughs) of shit. Tommy Tuberville sounds like a villager in Animal Crossing. Anyway, old Tommy T here. uh, He was one of the winningest coaches in Auburn history. He got them, what, one title, two? They won one title. They honestly should have won two, but that's fine. But yeah, so he, he won one title for Auburn, and there's only two schools in the state of Alabama that people care about, Auburn, Alabama. Uh, but so, so Tuberville has like a Tuberville, whatever, has a uh, like larger than life presence in the state. It, it's one of the the things that you see in most uh, smaller states where like any sort of big coach can run for a political office and do fairly well. He he just recently beat Sessions in the primary, and this will determine who goes against uh, the current senator, who is Doug Jones, uh, the Democrat who won purely because after Sessions left. Uh, they did the election to see who was going to come in, and it was Doug Jones against um, Roy Moore. You remember Roy Moore, right, guys? The the super, super creepy pedophile guy. So the only reason a Democrat won is because he was going against one of the most disgusting candidates to run for United States Senate in a while. And even then, it was fucking close. Yeah. And since then, Doug Jones has been, I don't know, pretty mediocre, voted with the party line, most of the time on the Democrat side, but hasn't stuck his neck out for anything particularly exciting. Basically, he's not someone you're going to get excited about. Uh, and he did vote for a bunch of Republican federal judges, which I personally can't Fucking stand. Fucking every Democrat votes for the federal judges. Chris Coons, uh, who is, you know, hopefully about to get primaried. Uh, you know, he votes for every federal judge he gets a chance to. Uh, Joe Manchin took a picture of himself toasting, uh, not only votes for all the federal judges, but got his picture taken with Susan Collins toasting after they managed to get Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court. So, you know, they all love them, some federal judges in that Democratic side of the Senate. Yeah, that, that doesn't really make me uh, more forgiving. It just makes me think that most of the Democrat senators are just Republicans, which they are. So uh, Doug Jones is, you know, not quite as bad as Manchin, but that is damning with faint praise. Um, largely, though, he's just not particularly exciting. And now Alabama is running Tommy Tuberville, a guy who is like a good old boy style Alabama politician. Like he's he is what you expect in the South. What is interesting to me about Tuberville, though, in the modern era is like back in the day, the good old boy Southern politicians would at least like the whole point was you're delivering something to the state. Like you would make backroom deals and then you would get some of that pork spending that was oh so evil funneled to your state. So the state of Alabama, if you had a good politician, would get some money for infrastructure projects and stuff like that. Um, so now that they've killed the entire system by which they used to divert money to various states through park spending, the good old boys have no interest in doing government. Now it's just about like whatever's popular. So Tuberville aligned himself with Trump immediately. And he's just ridden that all the way to the finish line. Yeah, and for those that don't know, the way that like the Senate used to work essentially was that to get the South to do anything, these senators just got bribed. So you'd have a bill that was like, you know, to to help p- black people that were drowning. And the Southerners were like, well, we can't vote for this. And so they would apply, you know, well, we're going to give Alabama, you know, uh, a space center and a bunch of money to build, you know, electrical lines so your people can live past the age of 40. And, you know, the the Alabama senator would be like, well, let me take this back to Tuscaloosa and see. And so the way that was presented locally was that Alabama senator signs landmark bill to bring, you know, clean water to the majority of the state and they don't you know mention that this was actually part of a much larger bill that had this package but ever since they got rid of the ability to put this these what was called pork into the bills this was john yeah, banner's uh, john banner's dis, uh, defining you know moment as a legislator instead of these guys needing to you know sell themselves out to democrats from the northeast and the west they were just getting um you know, private campaign donations from whomever. 
And so that's really the main reason they, that in that uh, the right wing media is now nationalized. It's not localized. Right. How these guys operate so well, you know, intact, you know, back in the day, like the, the Southern, you know, Republicans or, or Southern Democrats, there was a switch that occurred in 1968, 1972. They would vote for national products or projects. But when that, you know, national election came, they would be voting third party Dixiecrats for like, you know, George Wallace, who ran on a strict segregationist policy. So things like that. Yeah. And so now there's no there's no incentive to the senators need to be bribed because they're just getting their money secondhand. And you have someone like Tommy Tuberville who has no experience in politics, who is running to the right of Donald Trump, who is still receiving a pension from the state of Alabama, one of the highest paid public employees in the history of Alabama because he was the head coach at a public university, <laughs> is now going to be a senator. That is a fun fact about uh, head coaches is if you look up the highest paid public employees in basically any southern state, they're always the head coach of the football team. In most of the country, any state, uh, the highest public employee usually is a coach of some yeah, kind. Yeah, North Carolina's but, Roy Roy Williams. South Carolina's obviously Dabo Sweeney. You know, Georgia's obviously <laughs> yeah, fucking Dabo Sweeney. Florida, surprisingly, Jimmy Buffett. Not a head coach, but the poet laureate of Florida. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, back in the day, Tommy Tuberville would have been the kind of person where it's like, that's a fairly standard Southern politician. He's not really going to improve things, but he might funnel some money to the state. Sure. Now, uh, thanks to them changing the Senate appropriations process, no one in the Senate has to vote on a fucking thing other than hard line ideological choices, which means nothing ever gets done unless the Democrats compromise, which they always do. Uh, so the Democrats are just always helping the Republicans who never, ever have the incentive to vote on things. Because if they need bribes, they can just get them from the private sector now. There's no such thing as like public money flowing into your state so you can build the most beautiful highways in the world in southwest Alabama where there n no one is living. You can get a Lockheed plant, though. <laughs> That's true. It was, it was nice to see Jeff Sessions lose and see another Confederate monument die. Uh, but it, it's hard to be excited about Tommy Tuberville because, you know, he's going to vote uh, in line with whatever insane ideological bullshit the Republicans are peddling. Also, Chuck Todd is going to start trying his hand at football metaphors. <laughs> the only good part about um, Tommy Tuberville likely about to win is that the Alabama Democrats are just shitting on him for his time at Auburn. And which is, you know, it's Tuscaloosa did not vote for uh, <laughs> Tommy Tuberville in that primary. <laughs> That's how, like, deep this shit goes. And so the Democrats are just fucking having a great time. For example, a uh, tweet, uh, Doug Jones got justice for four little girls murdered during church by the Klan. Tommy Tuberville thought a one-game suspension was enough when one of his players raped an underage girl. Uh, <laughs> which one cares more about your daughter's future? <laughs> oh, my God. That's going harder than Democrats usually go. So Absolutely. good for them. Listen, I'm glad. I'm glad all it took was football for them to give a fuck. Shit, listen, listen to this. He lost his last Iron Bowl, thirty six nothing. Collects millions of dollars in pension money from hardworking Alabamians and bilks investors based on their trust in his investment advice. Tubbs, Doug's gonna run through you like Fred Talley at an eleven a.m. Jefferson Pilot game. Hashtag one Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> It's just such like deeply local petty shit. I love that the dueling banjos faction is fighting the Dixie faction. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, though, so Jeff Sessions, that's pretty much going to close the book on him existing and being relevant in American history. So hallelujah on that. No, he'll be on MSNBC like next week as a as a special commentator. A hundred percent. Uh, if, uh, that seems far-fetched, but when I had to watch a week of John Bolton be feted by Joanne Reed, it's like oh God. anything is possible. So uh, because American news has been depressing, I, I've just been trying to look at anything else. I've just been looking up how other countries are doing quarantine and staring at them longingly <laughs> and wishing I was there. I like how you're longingly looking at quarantine scenarios. <laughs> what what <laughs> would have been like years ago a like a uh, horror film type like hostile situation you know like oh my god it's the apocalypse and you're locked inside now you're looking at it like eh, not too shabby look at that functioning government <laughs> so we talked uh, uh about uh vietnam having zero deaths still uh on the last bonus and about how they basically moved heaven and earth to save the the one british dude who almost died but in that process, I, I got uh, invested in just researching other countries and seeing how everybody's doing things. 
Um, and so for one, South Korea this week, uh, a bunch of stuff went viral of people uh, being like, anyway, so this is what they do if you're like an American or something and you came here and now you have to quarantine. So they have him locked in a hotel room for two weeks and they deliver all these supplies to him cleaning products food uh they bring him meals every few hours <laughs> like it's just south korea <laughs> south korea's quarantine is by far better than the average american lives right now yeah the thing about south korea is you you look at vietnam and you go wow they are really excelling at, at fighting this covid thing and and keeping people healthy and alive and addressing the the public health risks right mm-hmm but they're actually a socialist state. So of course they have the power to do that. South Korea is a capitalist hellscape that was basically a dictatorship very recently. Yeah, And they can also do it just by, <laughs> like, it's not even that like you necessarily need socialism to address this. You just need to not be a dipshit government through and through. You just need to have a government that gives a fuck about taking care of the people in any way, shape or form, even uh, if it's just like, hey, we want to get the economy back on track, but that won't work if we constantly have outbreaks, which, correct. So South Korea, I I keep watching the TikTok of that dude walking through his hotel room, desperately wishing I was there. And then I looked at Japan, and Japan's is going okay. They just had an outbreak in Tokyo, but because they have one of the better contact tracing, they immediately figured out where it came from. They were like, this is bad. We're shutting it down. We're tracking everybody down. Their other big cluster outside of Tokyo <laughs> is coming from the Marines in Okinawa. Semper Fi, brother. <laughs> uh, it came out that like uh, Okinawa had zero cases. And then overnight, the cases went to like 150 because the Marines, the Marine base reported theirs. <laughs> just Neil Patrick Harris being like, Marines, it's not just the clap anymore. <laughs> Tony uh, Wards, anybody? <laughs> and so for decades now okinawan politicians have run on get the marines the fuck out of okinawa right because uh, all they do is cause problems for the locals this happens by the way no matter what country or locality a base is stationed in uh the military tends to cause problems for the locals we are absolutely loathed in the states in the small towns that bases are stationed in uh for all this like well the locals should be thankful because we bring them jobs like fuck that that's not how it works it, it's a very par- parasitic relationship they hate you us. mean you don't want to uh, like work at like a subaru dealership outside of fort bragg well you know <laughs> exactly so this isn't this isn't unique to japan it's just uh heightened because not only is it the normal like well we hate this military but it's not even our military it's some fucking assholes from another country who are still here for some reason right and won't leave but so it came out the Marines had a ton of cases uh, and then videos uh, surfaced of them all r- having like raging parties on 4th of July, mask free on the island. And so the whole island's up in arms about it, justifiably. You're spreading a plague. <laughs> oh, and, the, you know, the, 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 the Marines in Okinawa is like this. The, it's not just COVID and it's not just them being asshole, you know, 20 year old kids running around Japan who don't know anything about the culture. Like there are several uh, sex crimes that happen like each month, which oh, yeah. are tracked back to the base. And like once every two years, a helicopter crashes into an apartment complex because that island is so dense. Like anytime the wind blows sideways, some pilot just goes straight into a residential district. And they've also had a few murders too. Oh God, one yeah. of the guys that I, um, one of my uh, my friends from uh, business school got out of the Marines because he was stationed in Okinawa and one of his Marines, he got woken up in the middle of the night with a call that was like, hey, we're pretty sure one of your Marines um, uh, killed his best friend and his wife and beheaded them and then killed himself. And he was like, well, I'm done and left. Tuesday already. <laughs> 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 that was, he uh, does a gym face into the camera. <laughs> like, uh, it, it's just horrifying what happens in Okinawa from the Marines. So it, it's another in a long line of abuses perpetrated by the Marines in Okinawa. And also, great job, America, on making sure to fuck over other countries that are doing a decent job by spreading it to them. So that was Japan. Uh, then I popped over to India, and that was oh, way more alarming. Indi- India's case curve looks like an exponential function just graphed like it's just you can just watch it slowly becoming vertical and you're just like oh boy uh they haven't reached our level yet but it it there's been no bumps or drop-offs the entire time so india is specific india can have any drug in the world there's no such thing as copyright protections they have a nominal uh public health system uh has a lot of problems i'm not doing this description justice at all but you can get care if you look at any kind of Indian city, any kind of public transportation, their ideas of um, 
personal space are completely different than ours. And there's just no way like this could possibly not happen in India. Um, and they don't have the same mask adoption strategies that like some of the denture or Asian cities. Have no, there's Asian nothing cities. like that at all. And you're, you know, I think they've, you know, some cities have shut down places where there's air conditioning. The, the majority of people in India don't have access to air conditioning. Um, that's that's one of the main like movers of the virus. But like one of the reasons people go see movies so often in India is because the movie theaters have air conditioning and they just sort of like cool off for a while during the middle of the day. Um, that's also a Florida thing. Yeah, that way. actually yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> you still live there. Yeah, right? yeah. I spent seven months there. Just just to give you an idea of like you know you try to describe like what is you know a city of twenty five million people. And it's really difficult to even like fathom, and even like see, when you see it, you can't really like figure out what you're looking at. But like, if you, there are so many, Delhi built a subway system that nobody uses because they're, um, there's they estimate like anywhere from like six hundred to a million people, six hundred thousand to a million people living in the subway, and they just have no idea. Like that's how poor and how overcrowded these cities are. This was always gonna happen. This was always gonna happen in India. Always, they also have a, a a right wing leader, which has been a pretty good correlation for the t- countries that are doing the worst in response. And they have a caste system on top of it. Like it's just it's it's you know it's your perfect mix of uh, right wing corruption, right wing and uh, you know an institutional indifference. I think my favorite like little tidbit about Modi was he was uh, the the state he was in charge of in two thousand two thousand one. Uh, he was in charge of, well, he oversaw and possibly armed uh, Hindu nationalist mobs, which committed a pogrom against Muslim inhabitants of the state. And he was very much in charge of, like, aware, at the very least aware it was going on and did nothing to stop it. And his visa was revoked. Uh, he could not travel to the United States because of this. The State Department thought this. You mean to tell me in 2000, 2001, you got your visa suspended by the Bush administration for killing Muslims? You were that good at doing it. Yeah, that's you got to be like way out on the line yeah, for that yeah, one. Yeah. Obama reinstated it, by the way. Obama, thank you. <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> well, it's because like once he won a uh, premiership, they kind of had to. I, I will say that in two thousand, oh god, when was I there? Uh, Sixteen or seventeen? I remember I was there when the election happened, and I remember buses going up to like all like the poor slums and then just like pushing everybody into the bus. And basically everyone got like $2 and a flask of whiskey and they were told who to go vote for. And you know, in a lot of ways, I think that's probably a better system than what we have here because all those people absolutely (laughs) got more for their vote than we got uh, voting for Obama in 2012. True. Or you're going to get from Joe Biden if you vote for him in uh, 2020. (laughs) Speaking of uh, Obama and Biden, Both of them, along with a ton of other gigantic Twitter accounts, got hacked this week. And it was all for a Bitcoin scam. What happened is all of these giant blue check accounts, uh, including Jeff Bezos, posted the same tweet. And it was, I am giving back to the community. All Bitcoin sent to the address below will be sent back doubled. If you send $1,000, I'll send back $2,000. Only doing this for 30 minutes is what all the tweets said. (laughs) That that fucking rules. Did you, did you see that, Brad? I want to say not only uh, did I see that, but my account was also shut down, which makes me think that I am just as big as Jeffrey Bezos or Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> Your account was shut yeah, down? Yeah, I couldn't tweet all day. <laughs> Are you like a blue check? Fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> but They're just like, well, while, while we're here, let's make that Brad guy. guy shut the fuck up for a bit. <laughs> If we're closing accounts, right, we, we all get one or two personal choices. <laughs> so I think what it is is because that Wayfair walkout that I was connected to way back when, Wayfair now is such a big, like, Twitter thing because everyone thinks they're trafficking children. Oh, yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, so and I'm so blowing up again for that. And I'm all these, like, Q mom, you know, 1968 Trump MAGA, like, people are uh, retweeting me. <laughs> like, no, stop, please. That rules. <laughs> Every, everyone online is a psychopath and an idiot, including myself. But like when when Biden got hacked and was like, yep, I'm going to send back to the community. A, I knew that was fake instantly because like, number one, Biden never does anything for anyone. Uh, and number two, Joe Biden does not know about Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> That guy's still like, that Williams Jennings Bryant, he had some ideas. That's where he's at on currency. <laughs> and they will not crucify us on a cross made of silver or gold. Joe Biden. 
2020. <laughs> Fol- folks, the, the cross is made. It's made out of uh, a blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> It would be so sick if Joe Biden got into cryptocurrency. <laughs> Look, if you ain't got Bitcoin, Charlemagne, you ain't black. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot in those days. There was a Tor server, all right? And I was an admin there. <laughs> if you fell off the Silk Road, you get pinched. And Aaron what? Swartz, he used to message me. He'd say, <laughs> stop posting those leg hairs, but they look good in the light, Jack, in 1080p. You could sell the pictures for Ethereum. Uh, so after and the that hack- Mark Carpalis was a bad dude. He called himself Magical Tux. <laughs> <laughs> Ran with a bunch of black hat guys. And I, I, you know, back in those days, you know, you had to see how things change. One of the things you do is you get the Bitcoin and you put your wallet in Mount Gox. And there's a guy, <laughs> guy named Satoshi Nakamoto. He was the only Japanese guy I knew. He came to the basement with me with the graphics cards. <laughs> and that's where they kept the GeForce GTX 1070s. And this is for the SLA. He was the mechanic. And back then, <laughs> people would leave the cards in the water to dissipate the heat. <laughs> and he showed me the blockchain. He said, you listen here. You're going to run out there with your private key, and you tell them you're doing the hash function, or you don't come back. I said, I said, Jack, we don't need, we don't need public trust anymore because you got a key and I got a key, and I apologize that I don't trust you, but I need you to respect the, the public blockchain. He said, all right. And that's, that's <laughs> when my heart started beating again. <laughs> And that's all I know about Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the most lucid Biden's ever been. That would rule. That's the only thing he knows. <laughs> yeah, I just thought that was delightful. It was also fun to look in, in, in the same way that like resistance people make fun of Trump, where it's like, well, now he wears the mask. And so now they all love they all love masks. Isn't that silly? If you looked in like the first 10 minutes in his mentions, it was all like, yes, sir, I'm buying Dogecoin right now to get that Cheeto. It was deranged. There was one dude who was definitely sent like 10 grand to Jeff Bezos and just kept pinging Bezos afterwards. Like, hey, where's my money? The tweet got deleted. What's going on? <laughs> if you kill yourself attempting auto fellatio, that's more dignified than sending money to Jeff Bezos. <laughs> and I really uh, hope that wasn't all that that hack was about. Like, I really hope the $50,000 in Bitcoin that guy managed to scam you know, after hacking all the world's most important people, it was just a smoke screen and that he's actually like holding them over the barrel for the DMs that he downloaded or whatever. God, I hope so, because that's the most high risk, low reward fucking uh, gambit I've ever heard of. I mean, that's like, less than like the average Bitcoin exchange loses when the owners and operators always vanish in the middle of the night and go to non-extradition <laughs> countries or go to India where like you don't need to prove there's a dead body to get a death certificate. And then people are like, wow, we can't get into that account anymore, but we can see money is still leaving mysteriously. Man, I wonder what happened again. <laughs> that's the reason though not to do the DM route, right? Because no... Those Mount Gox guys are all just like living on private islands now, like like OJ Simpson, like, yeah, I did that shit. <laughs> if, if, if you leak the DMs, Jeffrey Epstein had DVDs. He's fucking dead now. <laughs> That's true. No, Obama and Biden and Bezos are like, yeah, who gives a shit about some hack? Like, if it didn't actually affect them, they're probably more angry at the possibility it could have resulted in DMs and these other things than the fact that it was some Bitcoin thing. I don't want to see any of the DMs just in principle because last time someone hacked the DMs and tried that like shit, we we all got Jeff Bezos's dick. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, true. Yeah, but like Obama, you know, he does not have anything bad on the DMs of his Twitter. Like everything will be because he doesn't run his Twitter. Yeah, yeah, everything would be like, thank you for contacting uh, President Obama. He's really into hearing what you have to say. Please, yeah, the, the real Obama ludes are on kick. <laughs> <laughs> No, there are the Obama DMs of him just being like, anyway, fuck that Bernie guy. Yeah, those exist. But like, you know, if you like hack Jared Kushner's DMs, it would absolutely be him and MBS being like, yeah, we should murder, murder the Jews. Let me figure out how we can get away with this. <laughs> and then Fox News would spin it the next day and wouldn't hurt him at Israel, all. Israel, friend, or are they? We have tonight on Laura Ingram. <laughs> By the way, all right, just random aside, but uh, uh, speaking of Israel, this is just something I sort of this crossed the transom and it's probably nothing now, but it's one of those things where I saw it. I'm like, okay, I need to maybe keep my eye on this. Um, Israel has been bombing and setting fires in Iran. Yeah. Uh, the, and it, the, the security service guy was like, no, we can't say or not say what we're doing, but obviously 
uh, disruption of Iran is a very important part of our strategy. Uh, they got another uh, security official on background who said, we call this strategy maximum pressure, minimum strategy. So the idea is just don't think it because critics go like, maybe you shouldn't be like literally taking violent actions in Iran right now of all times. And the idea is, look, we don't know where this is going to go, but more provocation of Iran is good for our national interests. And the security person said, we actually learned this maximum pressure, minimum strategy, chaos theory stuff from Trump, from American foreign policy. <laughs> because great. look, if you want to ramp up a war, you don't necessarily know how to get there. You, you got to let a thousand uh, war hawks bloom, basically. The idea, he was saying, uh, is that Mossad is especially active right now because they're afraid that while Biden uh, is just as war hawk as everybody else, uh, if they lose Trump, like if Trump gets voted out, it'll be harder to go absolutely mask off deranged. Like they think if they can bait Iran into a conflict before January, the United States will use that as they're like, well, yeah, we're looking for a way to juice the economy with the, a war. So yeah, that'll do. Thanks for that. You're going to see a, a ramping up of incidents by design from Mossad right now. And they're just out and out talking about it because they know they have the backing of their their special boy. The yeah, Chino. we've tried our hardest to uh, start a war with Iran for the last like two years. And every time it gets right to that point, Donald Trump loses his nerve, which fucking thank God for all of us. Um, but I mean, like we f they basically the fucking Th murked their like top military guy and like national hero and nothing ever came of it. We, we Yeah, the president has a warrant fucking from international law for doing that <laughs> trump incredible trump is gonna be like uh henry kissinger where like he has to clear it with the state department if he ever leaves the country after his presidency like you know, i can go to i can go to <laughs> spain right spain's fine yeah i like that they know though they know that that trump is a uh cowardly baby in this case uh, for good because he hasn't done anything yet but they know that he's not going to take initiative, but he'll definitely come through if forced and are just going fucking mask up. Look, this is this is why they're such a, an important strategic ally, right? And actually, you know, it has to be it has to be fucking said about Israeli foreign policy that let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy, the chocolate bars and the candy. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. And that's just that's the only way that things are ever going to materially improve. I don't. That just seems like common sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, yeah. 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 hundred yeah. percent. Brad, did, did you see this thing with Gorka? What is the latest Gorka news? Tell me. So it it's fun. all these like you know people that that role play like they're in the the Knights Hospitaller. They just can't stand where the right has gone. Like they they peddled the fucking drug of conspiracy theories and culture war uh, in increasing doses for so many decades now. So even like the, the old school uh, culture war stuff, like. Uh, we need to take back Auker from the moor. Like, that shit just isn't enough anymore. So Seb Gorka has his own radio program. Uh, <laughs> sure. At, at which, like, you're all, look, you're already fishing in a, a very depleted pool intellectually if you're someone <laughs> who's taking calls, like, like the people calling into the Seb Gorka show. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I saw this on uh, on the Majority Report, Sam Cedar. And it's just like, this clip is amazing. Like, it's so enjoyable to see all the, the neocons just be like, come on. Like, what have I done? Let's uh, go to yeah. Lisa in Denver. Okay. Line four. Welcome, Lisa. Line four. Hi, doctor. I like listening to you. And I saw you on TV before. And I trust your opinion. I wanted to ask you about this Michael Flynn. Doctor. He took an oath, supposedly, to the this QAnon that is supposed to be working with Trump to dismantle these global white um, devil worshiping pedophile networks. <laughs> and he did this with his family on the Fourth of so July sad. in a video. And I was just wondering if you what Lisa, your opinion Lisa, is on Lisa, 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 Lisa. Please stop. <laughs> it's all garbage.
Mike Flynn didn't take a vote to anything, okay? QAnon okay. is a scam. It's a cult. Please, Lisa, don't believe the garbage. Will you do that for me? Well, there really are pedophilia networks globally. <laughs> yeah, there there are pedophiles in every country, but there's no global network of pedophiles linked to the Illuminati or anything else, okay? It is absolute snake mm. oil. That's there is expensive. evil that walks the earth because man is fallen. But QAnon and everything they spread is utter complete garbage take it from a man who was with the president in the oval office yesterday okay it's a cult it's a con stay on the line my friend and we'll send you a copy of my latest book and you'll understand <laughs> just how much you and other do you understand how far right this nation has gone if like seb gorka is the voice of reason like his baseline, he's his ideology is man has fallen. There's, <laughs> you, you you won't understand until you read the apocrypha. It's in the book of Enoch. <laughs> man lie with the nephilim, and now our taxes are so like <laughs> he's looking at these people like what a bunch of right wing nut jobs, and he's not wrong, and also. They're not wrong because the thing that the lady was referring to, Lisa, Lisa, there. It's she, all garbage. She she was referring to uh, a video that happened last week. Oh, she's talking about uh, Mike Flynn doing a swearing in for uh, the, the QAnon yeah, stuff. Yeah, the Q, Q members, get... the, the people that follow Q, and who the fuck even knows what Q is at this point or how, like, whatever you want to describe it as. There's, like, an oath that has now appeared that you have to pledge to it. And there are several, several people who are running for the uh, members of the House who, uh, as on the Republican side, obviously, who have taken this oath and who are proud supporters. Recently, the um, the head of the New York City Police Union got did a Hell did yeah. a Fox News interview with a Q mug, like, prominently displayed in the background. It's not the first time he's done it. Like Ed Mullins, a guy who has him and Pat Lynch, which if you're like, those are... Names of the police union guys, yeah, they're exactly what you think. <laughs> These guys have more power in New York City than the mayor. They, they fucking doxed his own daughter and then said, do something about it. They tried to pass laws to stop them from doing chokeholds, and they said, well, fine, we just won't work anymore. <laughs> like That's why we got into this. They're QAnon supporters. Publicly, it's not even like it's kind Proudly. of embarrassing. It's not, you know, it's a little embarrassing, but you know, this Q guy has some ideas. It's like they're on Fox News, like, I'm in charge of one of the largest armies in the world in the NYPD, and I think Q is doing some great law enforcement. <laughs> I like, though, the other thing about like, you know, Sebastian Gorka being the voice of reason. This is a guy who's been fired from the Trump administration twice, who drives around DC in a red topless Mustang GT with a custom license plate that says Art of War. Telling Lisa from Denver or, you know, Colorado Springs or wherever she's from that they were just in the Oval Office with the president talking about Q and how it's a complete farce. The pedophiles, yeah, that's 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 probably true. But there's no, like, unifying force behind them at the at the state level anyway. I'm just like Sun Tzu, he says, and he hits a switch and the suspension bumps up and down. <laughs> I just love, I, I want one day to be able to have that sort of, like, smooth switching ability between it's a con and if you stay on the line i'll give you my book lisa you're a fucking moron stay on the line and we will give you a copy of my new novella do you under <laughs> lisa listen to me do you understand how ridiculous you sound our immigration policy was fallen ever since lot's wife turned to salt <laughs> ground yourself in reality i'll send my book <laughs> Mike Flynn has a video of him with his family doing the oath to QAnon, and it's clearly modeled after like the oath you take in military service, um, or for an oath of office. Purposefully, probably, because now you're supporting the troops. Well, look, when one of the the big generals who supposedly isn't there an oath that you take? Yeah, generals. Though, I mean, it's so weird doing the like general swore an oath. Those dudes do whatever the fuck they want. Like, the, none of that shit applies to them. They're they're oligarchs they have their little fiefdoms like there's a reason they do whatever the fuck they want because even when they're caught like flynn uh it took a lot to even get him charged 
then he immediately got off, right? Jerome Petraeus was straight up leaking secrets. Leaking secrets Nothing happened to, to his him. mistress. Like, he was cheating <laughs> on his wife, and then, like, their pillow talk was like, yeah, you know, honestly, we're probably kind of aligned with the Taliban these days. Uh, <laughs> what horrible pillow talk. <laughs> Who is also, she's also, like, a reporter. It's- so he was, like, leaking secrets to the reporter that he was sleeping with on the side. And again, that's pretty normal. When I was stationed in uh, Europe, one of the big generals in Europe was caught sleeping with a literal Russian asset and leaking her secrets, like just doing the honeypot scheme. Nothing happened to him. He got demoted one rank, which means you're still incredibly powerful, and just moved to another unit. That's it. The, the idea of like they have an oath that they care about is so fucking farcical. They do whatever the fuck they want. I like the idea that you could get basically Edward Snowden's entire hall just by blowing a, a lieutenant colonel. <laughs> conspiracies have always sort of existed on the right far more than they have in any way shape or form on the left although i guess this russia conspiracy stuff is is there but it's nowhere near what it is on the right just in general but like the left conspiracies have all been actual conspiracies (laughs) if you're like this gulf of tonkin thing seems pretty fishy people will be like shut up idiot and then five years later the new york times would vindicate you (laughs) (laughs) but like one of the one of the scariest things about q or like interesting on depending on your perspective on it i guess is that like it's somehow become a nexus for like every single conspiracy like for for whatever reason, I don't think like the Greys, aliens, and like the Black Hawk helicopters people ever really got together in the '90s. But like now, it's all like the the pedophiles are working with the the arachnoid amphibians who are drinking the adrenochrome that Hillary is giving them to fund the pedophiles <laughs> that are secretly working within the government against Donald. Like it's all it's it's complete nonsense. There's no you can't even approach it because it's so ridiculous from so many fucking levels. What's ironic is like they're actually kind of for the first time discovering community, but it's through conspiracy theories. <laughs> L- like you said, all the, the black helicopter guys and the grays guys, they were all just isolated kooks. But now, like, if you're a Bigfoot guy, you can go to the Q meeting and go like, well, imagine young Bigfoot adrenochrome. Do you think the government might have that? And, and somebody from the black helicopter group could be like, they'd have the recon to find it. <laughs> everyone is welcome there's no fact checking no one even there's not even a q person it's just a random assortment of things that you tie together with twine what a what a great way to be alive (laughs) glad i got to experience all this. just finding meaning in absolute nothing not like me who stands twice (laughs) i was gonna say i I, i'm finding a lot of meaning from uh k-pop these days Although, in my defense, they've justifiably helped my material interest more oh, than anyone bre- else. Tell the people, Brett. Tell, uh, tell what Shonu did for you. So, so Rob and I are at, like, uh, difficult-to-pay-rent-next month stage. I had a uh, medical emergency. Like, the GI Bill things, it's all Yeah, and the GI up. Bill just doesn't pay it's for a full month. Time. And all my other income sources have shockingly just dried up now that we're in, like, full economic collapse. Um, so, I, I, I'm at, like, oh, I guess I'm selling a bunch of shit that I have and hope I can make rent. And if then, anyone needs a switch, <laughs> that was an advertisement for my Fet Life. But also, we do have the, the <laughs> we do have the console available. Uh, but so, in the midst of all this, uh, one of the the tickets that we'd bought for a K-pop concert at the beginning of June for Monster X got canceled. Right? Didn't see anything about it, and they were like, "Hey, at some point, we'll update you about refund or reschedule." And so this week, they were like, "We're going to reschedule it for 2021, and also give you a refund." So thanks to Shonu, I might make rent. <laughs> yeah, I like how you could not get the uh, the Trump bailout, the Trump bucks, but you did receive Shonu bucks so you could go grocery shopping. <laughs> Monster X has done more for our material interest than the American government currently. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> they really have. Anyway, thank you, Shonu. Well, I will definitely be going to that concert if there's not a plague. Uh, Brad, you weren't here for it, but we did a bonus about like starting a pod and all the different ways to do it. And I was talking about how uh, we've unintentionally on the left done like the Blumhouse model of a, a thousand different iterations and styles uh, with the hopes that one of them breaks through, just increasing the odds. Um, and then I was watching uh, a rom-com the other day and Rob was like, I wonder if you do like a Blumhouse rom-com thing. I wonder if that was possible. Uh, and uh, as the as the resident rom-com expert, I was explaining that you actually can't. You can't do the Blumhouse model for rom-coms because rom-coms require a recognizable lead. A Blumhouse rom-com thing is basically the Hallmark channel or these other channels that are now explicitly, like in the age of streaming, there are explicitly romance or rom-com channels that you can subscribe to. 
And that's what those are. But yeah, so Blumhouse, for people who don't know, is is the style from horror movies. Uh, Blumhouse is this dude who decided, like, instead of spending $150 million on a single horror movie, I'll spend $10 million on 15 right. horror movies. With the, um, like the Hallmark Channel or whatever, like, you can tell, you know, that the, the cameras aren't that good. You know, they probably have one film crew that does them all and they just work on rotation. And every other one has like Lacey Chabert in it. That girl that was in, you know, uh, Mean Girls like 20 years ago. And all she does are, you know, <laughs> Summer of Love and like Christmas Miracle. And so you don't like all the guys kind of look the same, but I haven't recognized that brunette. Yeah, she's great. She's always in these. There, It's just the, the, the pool of actresses that Donald Trump still references from the 80s. <laughs> I was staring into the abyss by way of the Hulu idol screen that you get on the TV. And like they, there's pop-ups for like an all romance network. Like if they're getting venture capital, why can't they fucking do anything? So I was it? in uh, the Anna Nicole Smith story, which was a lifetime original or Hallmark. You killed her, so right? What, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, what, you were in the movie, the Anna Nicole yes. Smith story? I did not yeah. know that. Please tell me everything well, about that. <laughs> a- anyways, it was either Hallmark or Lifetime. I can't remember what it was. And like, I threatened the actor that like, I almost got in a fight with her son in a locker room. Like that was my scene. It wasn't much of a scene, but the, uh, the cameras were not great. Like they were great in like 1994 probably. And it just doesn't look really good for whatever reason. The funniest thing about that movie, it was directed by Mary Heron who wrote and directed American Psycho. And uh, she was just there for her director credit, I think. <laughs> I was going to say, it also makes sense because like, if you are a cinematographer or a director trying to you know, make your bones, you're not doing rom-coms because no one respects that as a medium, right? You're doing fucking horror movies or something else. You're doing something that like you can actually like flex a little bit and get some respect for. No one fucking respects rom-coms unless you're Nor Efren. That's oh it. yeah, to, to, to let good. you know how like sacrosanct the script was on this, every time one of the other guys in my shot would forget a line because he fucking sucked, Mary Heron would just walk on set and be like, "What was that line? Don't worry about that line. We'll cut it." All right, let's go back to one, guys. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense what you're saying about the directors too, because like you can do even if you don't have a huge budget in horror, that's sort of like grindhouse, like film grain, uh, low production quality thing. You can aestheticize that to fit the tone of the movie. Yeah. Not and showing the monster is good or the killer. In a rom-com, like things really have to be nicely lit. It has to be totally out of your way so you can immerse yourself in the character that you're imagining yourself as. Yes. And exactly. so also that means the writing has to be like pretty good. It has to be immersive enough to bring you in credibly. It has to be non-distract like yeah, that would be much harder. Yeah, it's a tight line to walk on the writing side and uh and it just works significantly better when there's a lead that you care for already because it does some of the heavy lifting of caring about the characters before you even get invested. Versus horror, it works better if you don't know the people, right? Because then you're not like, oh, it's a famous person within a monster movie. You're like, oh, hey, I could imagine myself as that regular schmo getting attacked. Like, that's terrifying. It looks more like a real person. That makes some amount of sense. But uh, uh, me and Brett, we're arguing a little bit about it because I actually don't think that's entirely true. Like, I don't think you need uh, a mega star for your rom-coms because I've watched, you know, uh, a handful of like Korean rom-coms and, <laughs> and like K dramas. And they do try to, you know, they try to use stars. Of course, it's usually like, they'll get like Bay Susie or just anybody that used to be in the Wonder Girls or A Pink or like, you know, they, they pull in idol people. Mm-hmm. They're not like mega stars in the same way. And they're, they're not really necessary because the thing about idols is they aren't iconic by design. You know, they, they can be swapped out and totally controlled. Oh, yeah. So they, they, you know, they have to be recognizable, but not like full star where they start demanding, <laughs> you know, a 1200 calorie daily right. intake. <laughs> The way that I've noticed they they get around that and still like bring people in and make it work is that just like with K-pop they 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 ruthlessly engineer plot so that whatever would be like okay that's enough for America they just add in an extra level like okay well they're all samurais now <laughs> or they're just it's just like we're just gonna throw a it's a maximalist approach to rom coms. Uh, and K-dramas, where it's just like, okay, you don't like this thing? There's another thing. This character's four different things. So me and Brett were just sort of, this is what we do under quarantine. 
uh, he was just he was just saying like, okay, what about this? We were just went through all of his favorite rom coms, and I just Korea eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Throw any rom com out. Okay, the big sick. What's the big big sick about? So the big sick is uh, the actual story about how Kamel Nunjani, the comedian, met his wife Emily Gordon, um, and so they wrote it. It's He's a comedian, a Pakistani comedian. He meets this girl at a comedy club. They sort of fall in love. Then they break up and she gets sick and he sticks around through it and helps her get well. And so they fall back in love. Is that good? It's a pretty good one. It's fantastic. All right. Well, let me hit you with this. It's the same plot, but you replace Kamal with Jungkook. <laughs> but he's playing himself as Jungkook. He's a famous idol. And he has to convince the family that he's not staying by the hospital bed as a publicity thing. Oh, that's actually a really good idea. <laughs> yeah, I would actually watch that. that no, they've got it figured out. Yeah. <laughs> that hit, does sound good. Yeah, hit, hit, keep going. Uh, all right, how about While You Were Sleeping? What is While You Were Sleeping? Okay, so that's uh, Sandra Bullock and Bill Pullman. Sandra Bullock, this is set in the 90s. She basically works for the Chicago MTA, whatever the fuck that's called. She's one of the booth attendants. She takes coins every day. And there's this beautiful man she always sees that she's like creating this romance in her head about. And then one day he gets jumped and like falls on the tracks and she goes down and saves him before he gets run over, goes with him to the hospital uh, and is like, hey, is he okay? What's going on? And the nurse is like, yeah, he's in a coma now. He like took a big knock on the head. And so as they're walking away just to herself, she's like, oh, I was going to marry him. And a nurse overhears. Here's the misunderstanding. Every rom-com needs misunderstanding. Nurse overhears and thinks that like that's his fiance. So then the family shows up and they're like, oh my God, you're the fiance. He never tells us anything. Of course, that makes sense. And so while he's in this coma, she gets like pseudo adopted by this family uh, and falls in love with the brother, Bill Pullman. And then the dude wakes up. Great movie. That actually does sound pretty good. It's, it's really fucking oh, okay. good. Okay. So she falls in love with Bill Pullman or Peter Gallagher? So she she thinks she's in love with uh, Peter Gallagher, the brother who's ends in the coma. Being and Noel Gallagher. <laughs> but ends up following falling in love with Bill Pullman because she's actually interacting with him and gets along with him. It's not just some romance. Got in her it. Head. Okay. I'm here. Uh, I'll be on. I, I think I might lose this one. That that sounds pretty good. It is. It's quite. Good. Uh, that's like all. See, that's already like complex enough that it works. Although I will say, there is already a Korean while you were sleeping called while you were sleeping. It's a, <laughs> got it. It's got a great OST. Uh, Henry has some great ballads on it. Uh, but in the Korean one, it's totally different. It's uh, it's a journalist discovers that she gets premonitions of murders every time she falls asleep. So then a handsome cop and a handsome defense attorney show up and everyone ends up fucking each other. <laughs> That's the, it's a love triangle where she's psychic and also they're solving murders. Yeah, this one's better. I think that's, I, I think that's too better. different of uh, a genres, really. That The second one... I didn't write it. I'm just saying. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, yeah, I don't really need to see courtroom drama and the cops in my rom-com, so may maybe you get that one. Okay, name another one. Uh, Clueless. Clue. Okay. You know what Clueless is. Four words. Paul Rudd is deaf. <laughs> <laughs> This is this is also a real Korean. <laughs> He's the Grim Reaper. He was sent to claim Alicia Silverstone. Nothing else changes. Yeah, no, that does make it better. <laughs> yeah, so wait, does look. Paul Rudd have to decide whether he's going to take Alicia Silverstone to the underworld or live as a human and give up his immortality? That's one of the conflicts. <laughs> you got like five. He's I, I love how this is clueless. Uh, is mashed with meets Joe Black. <laughs> Nothing changes in the movie. He still <laughs> says all those lines. But he is the Grim Reaper. <laughs> Does she know or not? Does she try to save him? Is it in self-interest or they really have a connection? That's a better movie. A better yes, movie. I would like to see Paul Rudd, who is ageless anyway, so it makes perfect sense that he is actually, in fact, in real That's life true. as well, um, death walking among <laughs> us. Also, if he touched me, I would die. <laughs> uh, okay, so how about When Harry Met Sally? What's Harry Met Sally about? Uh, that one's actually pretty straightforward. Billy Crystal, Meg Ryan, the first third of the movie is them meeting over the years and just not liking each other at all. He keeps hitting on her. She's not interested. He's also just like casually lecherous asshole. He's Billy Crystal. Um, and then they meet later on when and they're... he's doing jazz, man. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, now you're talking. <laughs> uh, and then they meet and um, they've both just gone through like horrific breakups like he uh just got divorced she just uh ended a like 40-year relationship and so they become friends and then they fall in love all right this is another actual korean series sally depressed nurse at the hospital 
who used magic to switch souls with Harry's dying grandmother. <laughs> what the fuck? So the so the original <laughs> Sally becomes the the old grandmother and dies, and the grandmother becomes Sally. We're after the first third of the movie, so now all of a sudden they haven't got along. But now there is some new connection, and it feels like you know he's really understood. That's because <laughs> he's pursuing his grandmother now, who has forgotten. <laughs> in the hospital, there was no what tenderness. No one came to to visit her, and she realized how isolated she was. And now she's getting the tenderness uh, from her family, and maybe even a bit of romantic tenderness. Real Korean one, only in the Korean one, uh, the grandma's in prison too. Because <laughs> why not? <laughs> I'll be honest, I prefer the regular one. I was going to say, when Harry <laughs> Metzali is so straightforward, anything would spice it up, but that is too much. So wait, hold on, hold on, Rob. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm let, me just, let me just ask some clarifying questions. <laughs> so it's his own grandmother who a depressed nurse switched souls with, so now the de dying depre grandmother is in the depressed nurse's body, and I'm assuming she's beautiful, but she is still her yeah. soul... <laughs> no, no, everything is still the same. It's still Meg Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> but like now, now the grandma's soul in Meg Ryan body is hitting on her grandson. Yes, that is again also what a, she's. She hasn't had human touch or been seen. This is a problem with with the elderly, right? It's like once you no longer have value, you become like a burden, and she's been a burden for years to Harry. And all of a sudden, this isn't what she intended, right? She just, you know, Harry calls her she doesn't even know that that this relationship's going on right she just all of a sudden harry lights up and she goes it can't be the real harry and you know he's trying his best and you know they go out to these dates and you wouldn't think it but they start clicking and the whole movie unfolds just as does it, it unfold or does it <laughs> unravel <laughs> no please don't have sex <laughs> <laughs> they do spoilers for the korean one they do no i'm sorry the original is better because that's just way too much <laughs> why is she in prison too <laughs> because look maybe you got bored by the other shit you want to see some prison fights that also happens <laughs> incredible it's just it's just maximalism across the board i'll be honest the 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 grandma one it's 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 just as like uh, creepy, sexual, salty as you. Th There's no consent anywhere in that entire series. It's a mainstream primetime K drama. <laughs> oh, it's a series. No. Oh, God. I thought it was just a movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you need to put character development in. Incredible. All right, but how about uh, You've Got Mail? I, have I seen You've Got uh, Mail? It's. It's, Isn't that the same thing as. Uh, it's the Christmas exact Hill? same fucking movie, except they have AOL. Uh, you've got Mail, Meg Ryan, Tom Hanks, so classic duo for rom-coms. Um, they've been speaking online and are kind of in love with each other, even though they have real relationships. He ends up meeting her in person right at the beginning of the movie. They obviously don't know, right? There's an instant connection, but it doesn't go anywhere because he uh, runs what is basically Barnes & Noble. You can tell this is set in like the late 90s, early 2000s. Barnes & Noble, they're going to be the one to dominate the market. Yeah, exactly. Or borders, whatever. Uh, and CDs and books. You got me. <laughs> she runs a local bookstore. So they have a whole like company conflict thing. And in the middle of this, they go to meet in person while the conflict's at its highest. Uh, he walks in or about to walk in, sees it's her and bails. Right. And so everything builds from there. And to him being like, fuck, no, I, it can't be her because I hate her in person. And so it becomes a whole thing where he like gets comfortable with it. And then basically like on the sly, knowing that like he's the person talking to her online and in person, uh, leverages that to get her to fall in love with him, his in-person version of himself. It's a little creepy after driving her out of business. It's really Nora Ephron flexing and being like, you'll love this movie. You fucking swine. And it's great. <laughs> I got creepy for you. <laughs> and look the last one was fucking body switching fuck grandma so <laughs> just the, in so in korea they always love because there has to be something extra and you have to be like a powerful person on top of what you're doing so it's like almost everyone's a ceo of some sort yeah like course. that that's that's like half the genre so you've got mail okay hear me out tom hanks right or that character he's the dour 16 year old shit poster heir to a logistics company that's trying to privatize his high school. Meg Ryan teaches at the school and falls in love with this random accounts shit posting free spirit. 
At school, she's giving them detention, but online, they're an odd couple who fall in love. It's extremely sexually problematic, but most rom-coms are. <laughs> and there's, there's a scene in detention, right, where, where he's on the phone messaging her, and she's at the front of the room, and she's messaging him, and they're both smiling, and an icon's love scenario plays, and they all end up in a private prison owned by the heir happily ever after. What? Why? Because, like, overseas, they're both sexual predators or something like that? <laughs> it needs to be addressed at some point, but you don't want to ruin the fantasy early. <laughs> also, I looked at the trailer for You've Got Mail. Did you know Dave Chappelle and Steve Zahn are in that movie? Yeah. They're oh, both great. Steve Zahn. Too. That's Bring awesome. it back. Dave Chappelle comes back in the Korean version as the kid's chief financial officer. It's very funny in the modern era, by the way, to go back and watch this because it's based on AOL and it's based on the concept of in-person giant bookstores being a thing. And you're just like, this is adorable. Steve Zahn is creepy in that? Yes. Okay. In that case, Steve Zahn is the, um, he's the company's uh, head counsel and he turns to the camera about a third of the way through and goes, well, you know, the age of consent in this country is 16 just for legal coverage <laughs> that's gonna be one of those things you have to look over for this one <laughs> brad are, are, are you buying what i'm selling you? so i i feel like i'm missing something where they end up in prison together happily ever after like i think for yeah that's because uh the climax is them after discovering each other they they have to rob a bank owned by his dad so they could run away together but it doesn't quite work out but it's sort of like the ending of the producers where they all end up in prison better oh. people <laughs> but wait, why does he need to rob yeah. his dad? He's the heir. I'm not going to give you the whole movie <laughs> if you're not going to pay me $12. He's clearly into this, though. I, I think the hook has got him. Oh, man. Look, you're thinking about it, aren't you? You've got mail. You're like, huh, borders. Oh, Steve's on. This one, you're trying to keep all the characters straight. Dave Chappelle's popping up. Everything you want I, is in I this movie. I think you're right. And I think I want to say that You've Got Mail is notable because like, it, is, it takes place in big box bookstores. And it's not even like the biggest failure of a company in that movie at all because it's about AOL. So, yeah, I'm going with the, uh, with the uh, you know, age misplacement Korean quasi statutory rape prison fantasy thing. <laughs> not that yeah. quasi. But yeah. <laughs> All right, 10 Things I Hate About You, which is just Taming of the Shrew, uh, set in high school. I don't know what Taming the Shrew is. <laughs> okay, so 10 Things I Hate About You is an uh, incredibly difficult uh, woman character in this is uh, seduced by a man who's being paid to seduce her just to soften her up, but actually falls in love with her. It all comes out in the big climax moment, uh, and then he still wins her over at the end. Uh, the sisters are the same person. It's Tyler Durden Fight Club. <laughs> it's multiple personalities <laughs> the rest of the movie does yeah, not change is it like, yeah yeah uh, exactly sorry. no i think we're done here right <laughs> why why tamper with perfection it's, we're done uh there's waitress uh waitress is about a small town waitress who works at a pie shop who creates like the most incredible pies she's in a really miserable marriage to an abusive husband uh she just found out she's pregnant and her gynecologist uh is a fill-in Fillon, it's Nathan Fillon, um, and they basically have this like tawdry romance throughout the movie up until she gives birth. All right, this one's ninety percent of the way there. I don't mean to critique, but uh, the waitress it, now she has agoraphobia, uh, and she is a small account baking YouTuber who's pursued by a series of more famous food bloggers. <laughs> No, I'm not going to mess with this one. I, the original Waitress is so fucking good. There's a reason it's a Broadway show. All right, that, that's, that's fine. <laughs> that's, I think there that's, is a reason I, that's on Broadway, okay? And popular. Look, my portfolio is only filling up as we go. What else you got? Uh, Juno. Juno, Ellen Page, Michael Sarah. Uh, Ellen Page uh, got pregnant from, like, their friends. Uh, they had sex once. She gets pregnant from it, decides to give the baby up for adoption. So there's a whole, like, interplay between her and the adoptive parents, and it's her trying to figure out how to navigate being a senior in high school and the michael sarah thing are we friends are we in love throughout the movie it's actually wonderful it's 300 years ago in korea <laughs> to avoid questions from her uptight family about having a child out of wedlock juno enlists the help of a professional fiance he is absolutely a serial killer and she has to choose between helping him cover up the murders or disappointing her traditional family <laughs> Rob's. Rob's. Really so real real Rob's. Rob's. Yeah. yeah, Rob's is better. That sounds awesome. There's still romance going on. <laughs> it's just there's stuff in, in between that's not just, you know, the fat friend. <laughs> okay, we could probably do like one or two more. Uh, Chocolat. 
I, I, I have no idea what happens in that movie. I love it because I don't it's rom coms and chocolate. That's so a win win. That's a lot. You can have this one. I'm not I'm not even gonna read a Wikipedia entry to figure <laughs> out what chocolate is about. That's fair. Just Johnny Depp's in it. You don't want to know. Just fucking I, I feel like I've done pretty well. Are, are there any are we missing any? Have we They're sleepless in Seattle. The the number one. Didn't we do we literally just did sleepless, didn't we? I mean, it is. Mail, which is the other sleepless is You've got mail. Oh, pretty similar. What's, okay. Except without the business stuff. What is, which, please. <laughs> I always think that's big, but that's a different one. That's, by the way, when you were giving me shade for the 16-year-old thing, in big, doesn't a guy become an adult man who has a, gets horny for an adult woman? Did oh, I no, 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 big no. is one she, of my favorites? She gets no, horny I did not. Him. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm just saying, cast ye stones <laughs> elsewhere. That's I, how that I proper. I say that's <laughs> one of my favorite movies for a reason. It's not. Um, All right, what happens in you got Sleepless in Seattle is it opens with uh Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan again. Tom Hanks, uh his wife has recently died. This kid calls a radio show on I want to say it's like Thanksgiving to say like uh I think my dad needs a new wife. And so they drag cool. they drag Tom Hanks onto the phone and he talks about how much he loved her and it becomes this like phenomenon. Meg Ryan's a reporter in Baltimore, she hears it, uh, does kind of fall for him and keeps listening to like additional stuff about him while she's engaged to Bill Pullman. Again. Yeah, Bill Pullman's in this one too. Uh hi, hi, I heard you needed a professional cuck. <laughs> <laughs> I got that cuck look type beat. Wait, uh, I don't wait. So he just goes on the radio and goes like, uh, I would uh, hello, future wife and Meg Ryan. No, no, he he basically explains like what he missed about his dead wife, right? And all these women are oh, listening the wife fall in love dead. with him, right? And so Meg Ryan, in particular being a reporter, has access to like resources to track him down and stuff. And so it's this whole thing where she like sends a letter. Uh, and the culmination is the kid goes to New York to meet the Meg Ryan character based off the letter she sent. The kid goes. The kid goes. Tom Hanks is forced to follow because his kid is flying to New York solo. So he's freaking the fuck out. Right. And uh, uh, that's good writing. So they meet each other on top of the Empire State Building, which is an homage to a very old movie that is referenced constantly within Sleepless in Seattle. Birth of a Nation. <laughs> 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 that actually sounds that sounds pretty good it's quite good okay so i want to i'm going to do this justice <laughs> the good news is as has been the case there is a korean version of this it's sort of close okay so just hear me out all right it's it's sleepless in seattle okay so meg ryan is an old woman who's the ceo of a robotics company and <laughs> she connects with tom hanks okay all right now, she's embarrassed about her age, and so she builds a clone, uh, uh, like a robot of her younger self with an AI that she trains how to love using old letters she wrote to her husband who died in the Korean War. <laughs> oh, dude, that's pretty fuck? good. <laughs> well, I'm this is a real one. <laughs> I mean, so, I do want to watch this. Well, wait, and we're, buddy, I, look, don't give me the money yet, okay? <laughs> I, here's the thing. Okay, mm -hmm. I know I've got you, but you can't just do one thing. So turns out by training her clone AI on how to love, she herself, the CEO, right? The cold CEO, the, the widow, she remembers how to love anew. But see, now it's too late, right? Because the, the robot that she had stand in, Serrano de Bergerac style, the robot and Tom Hanks have met and, and Tom Hanks is falling in love with her robot who's now having unique experiences and diverging from the way of love that the old lady uh, programmed it. So here's the thing. You're like, okay, so it's Tom Hanks and the robot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, because in that diverging, the robot falls out of love with Tom Hanks and falls in love with the memory of the dead husband. <laughs> so now so now the robot builds her own AI of the CEO's husband like in Westworld and marries them. <laughs> her robot is now married to the robot that's a duplicate of the husband and the two robots run off together. So Tom Hanks, he's fucking shattered. He sits down on the couch, right? He's like, I can't believe this has happened. What, how could this be? And then the old CEO comes out, the, the woman comes out and explains to Tom Hanks that she's sorry for everything she did, but like she's not young anymore. She thought, you know, she, she wouldn't be capable of love even if she could be, be loved. But now she knows that that's not true. And she, she's sorry for hurting him and trying to reconnect. And so Tom, Tom Hanks. See, I got you here. Do you see? I'm, not, <laughs> I'm, I'm enraptured. Tell so, me. So Tom Hanks looks at her and he freezes. And he, he says, debug mode. 
Tom Hanks was a robot too. Door to the back room opens. What? It's the husband. He says, no, I'm the one that's sorry. The old ass husband had to fake his death in the war because he was doing secret South Korean war crimes. And also he built his own robot because he saw that she was in robotics on her rise as a CEO and they're soulmates and the old people fuck and the robots fuck and they move in a multi-generational <laughs> household together. The end. Sleepless in Seattle. <laughs> Is that real? Amazing. That is like 80% a real Korean, <laughs> uh, Korean romantic comedy. It's a series. So. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I'm no, in for that one. Yeah. yeah, fuck your Blumhouse model. You just need enough ridiculous plot elements and <laughs> people will get sucked in. I mean, I'm, I'm literally like here with my mouth open. Like, wait, how is this happening? <laughs> Look, if you got that script, right? And, and you could be like, uh, uh, like the Westworld style, like robotics engineer that, that quips wise or like the confidant for the old CEO woman. It's like Korean Judy Dench. <laughs> You're telling me you don't at least give I'm that script a look? I'm jumping all over that. I'll audition for that. I mean, I'll actually come in. Like, you let me know <laughs> when and where. Sleepless in Seattle. It's good. It's not perfect is what I'm saying. <laughs> in, in, in your defense, Netflix is pumping out a ton of rom-coms, mostly with people you don't know, and a lot of them star Asian characters. So it does seem like, and they're good. So I, I don't know, like they're doing a little bit of both of those strategies at the same time. So like, I don't know, maybe they got your, uh, their, your notes. You don't have to duplicate the research. Korea has already succeeded with this method. <laughs> Just do what fucking, uh, the English did in world war two. Just steal the codes from another country. <laughs> Poland exactly. remembers <laughs> bomba machine. <laughs> Uh, anyway, thanks for listening, y'all. This has been Brett Rillis Ford, Rob at Dumb and Awful, Brad at Fizz for Shizzle. The show account's at Dumb Awful Show. We've been cranking out additional bonus episodes. If you want to hop on Patreon, we've got a bunch of stuff in there for you. That's patreon.com backslash dumb and awful. In addition to the bonus episodes, we've put out some video content, including a fun Polish parade video we shot in the fall before everything shut down. Just put that out this week. That's all there for you if you want to hop on Patreon. Uh, you can also join us in the Discord. Uh, there should be a link in the show notes. Thanks for listening, y'all. Have a good one.